Let me draw attention to the screen. Now, can you put the camera on the screen so the folks are watching see what I'm talking about? This is a fearsome looking guy there. Actually, I recognize that surplus. It's called surplus. And I used to wear it before we got liberated. Uh, my, they took it from my closet, I think. Uh, in fact, a, a friend of mine, a Baptist friend of mine, said, you guys wear surpluses, but in the Baptist church we have deficits. <laughs> now, I just want you to look at it. These are the things I showed you that were right here. Uh, a Roman soldier, fully equipped, except his tunic is not tucked in, should have been tucked in. <laughs> fully equipped, different equipment that we talked about in the last couple of messages, and if you have not seen those, download them or watch. We saw the three permanent ones that are permanently on, that can never be taken off, ever, ever, ever. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, and the shoes of the gospel. We saw the three that are always to be in a state of readiness for war, for welfare, warfare. Three must always be ready, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. So now I want you to imagine, okay, this is an imagining time, okay, that a, a Roman soldier has got all the equipment, everything he needs to be in that battle. And he finds himself in the battlefield in a very smoke-filled environment. I'm talking about thick smoke all around him. Smoke that makes it difficult for him even to breathe. He's well equipped. The, all the equipments are in the right place. But he's constantly coughing and clearing his throat because the smoke is just so thick. He's equipped. But he has blurry eyes from the smoke. You say, where are you going with this, Michael? I'm glad you asked. It would be a good question. Because after explaining the amazing provision of God of these six pieces of the whole armor of God, these six pieces of equipment, the Apostle Paul does not stop there. He cannot stop there. I think had he stopped there, we would have left out some or one of the most important thing, and that is the environment in which the battlefield is fought. Now, I'm talking about the urgent appeal by the Apostle Paul for the importance of prayfulness in the battle. Prayfulness in the battle. Now, I don't know about you, but I think <laughs> I've never met anybody any Christian believer who is very satisfied with their prayer life. <laughs> you may have. I have it. I'm not satisfied with my prayer life. I think most people are. And that is why when the subject of prayer comes up, people feel guilty. <laughs> Guys, I should have stayed home today. No, no, I'm glad you're here because I'm going to set you free by the power of the Holy Spirit from that guilt. And I pray that whatever stage you're in, in your prayer life, and whether you're discontented and unhappy with it, or you are or you're not, it doesn't matter. I am praying to the Lord all week, and I'm praying today, right now, that after this message, your prayer life will be absolutely revolutionized. Can I get an amen? amen. John Bunyan, in his classic book, Pilgrim's Progress. Now, I'm going to ask, not ask you to raise your hand if you've read it. But I, can, I want to encourage every parent to read that book with their children. In fact, there are modern translations, modern paraphrasing, and there are some movies, actually. The Children's Library has some. 
about that book. I read it when I was 12. And it truly, to this day, is impacting my life. In one place, Bunyan tells of Christian. Now, Christian is the main character, just if you haven't, not familiar with the book. Christian is the main character in Pilgrim's Progress. At one moment, he has a weapon called prayer, which when everything fails, it enables him to defeat the fins, that's F-I-E-N-D-S, that's an old English word for demons in the valley of the shadow. Himirat, please. The reason Paul closes Ephesians, the whole epistle of the Ephesians, to the Ephesians, the whole reason why he closes with the important of prayerful life is of absolute significance for everyone at the sound of my voice. Here's the reason why Paul does not include prayer as the number seven in the equipment of the armor of God. He could have said, well, yeah, there's another equipment. He did not include it as part of the equipment for the whole armor of God, the full armor of God. While prayer is closely, very, very closely associated with the full armor of God, it is much more than that. Why? Because prayer is not, is not, is not, is not just another spiritual weapon. <laughs> as vital as those six pieces of equipment that we've been seeing are, as absolutely necessary these six pieces of the full armor of God are, yet prayer is as important and necessary as the very air you breathe. Are you with me? Amen. And that is why I started by saying you can have all of the equipment, but if you, the, the, the environment is smoke-filled, if you can't breathe, then you're going to uh, absolutely fall in the battlefield. You will be discouraged and you feel weak. You could be equipped, but if there's a sick thick smoke all around you, and that is prayerlessness. And that's why Jesus in Luke 18, 1, he said to the Sabbath, he said, look, you could always pray. That is always meaning every moment of every day. <laughs> Listen to me. Our Lord knows that when the battle gets harder, and my goodness, it's getting harder now. If the lungs are not filled with fresh air of prayer, the soldier's going to get tired, it's going to get weak, and it's going to get discouraged. Someone may still ask, but with that breathtaking blessings that are in the first five chapters of Ephesians that Jonathan covered very ably the first, a few weeks ago, this breathtaking blessings that you have been blessed in every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, then he goes in and enumerates them with this impressive six-piece equipment for the whole armor of God. With all of that, why prayer is the most important of all? Ah, oh, great question. Listen to me. With all of these blessings in the first five chapters of Ephesians, with all of this powerful armor of God, we can be, with all of that, you with me? We can become vulnerable to the temptation of thinking, I must be a super duper. Do they use that kind of language now? Oh, that's my old. I must be so important. <laughs> <laughs> to be blessed this way, to have all those resources. That's some, um, I must be the best thing since sliced bread. I must be the best thing that's ever come down the pike. My, my goodness, my neighbors, they're stupid. They don't understand. I, I am blessed. What is that? Do you know what that is? Spiritual pride. <laughs> you see, that is the vulnerability with all of the blessings and of all the equipment is to 
have spiritual pride, spiritual arrogance, self-smugness. In fact, Satan can use all of these blessings, all of that equipment for the battlefield, all the armor, everything else, he can use them to turn our spiritual head. How can he do that? How can he turn our spiritual heads? We lose the sense of absolutely, totally, moment by moment, humbly dependent on God in prayer. Yes, yes. Good. Amen. And that is why praying in the Spirit is the most humbling position to be in. Praying in the Spirit is the most humbling position to be in. I read the other day about a football coach who was saying to his team after they lost the game, he said, "Uh, gentlemen, I told you how to win. (laughs) You did not do what I told you to do, and you lost. Oh, beloved, listen to me. We're, in many ways, we're like that team. We can have all the great skills. We can have all of the training. We can have all of the best equipment. We can have all of the head knowledge. But we can fail if we cease our utter dependence, complete dependence on the Lord in prayer. In fact, the whole letter of Ephesians, it begins, if you remember, it begins, you have been blessed in all heaven, spiritual heavenly, in the heavenly places and all the blessing. It begins by literally taking us all the way to the very portals of heaven. But then it closes, it closes by pulling us down on our knees of prayer. Pulls us all the way to heaven. But it closes. Says without this, you can't win. Question. (coughs) What is the Holy Spirit saying to us through the Apostle Paul? Listen carefully, please. Do not think for a moment that because you have all of these blessings, because you have all of these resources, because you have all of these equipments, because you have all of the head knowledge, that you can even take a breath. Just one breath. (gasps) One. Without humbly dependent on your heavenly Father. Amen. Can I get an amen? amen? Not even a breath. Please hear me right. I, I want you to read my lips, okay? Because I know this is something some Christians really fall for. Just listen, read my lips, okay? The full armor of God are neither mechanical nor magical. Did you get that? Amen. The whole armor of God, there, there's some people just think of it as mechanical. You just put the whole armor of God and now you've, no, no, no. They're not mechanical nor magical. Someone said many, many, many years ago, the gift without the giver is bare. Absolutely. The reason so often we see Christian believers who are so dried up, I mean, really dried up like an old bean. <laughs> this so dry, you, you know, a dried up bean, you can boil it, but it can never, never, never soften it. Do you know why? They're saved, but they're so dried up because they have ceased having broken spirit. And that is why David said, a broken and contrite heart. God will not despise. He will not despise. You know what happened probably long ago in their life? They focused on the gift and totally ignored the giver. 
Now, if you haven't already turned to Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 18, please do so now. As I conclude this very short series of messages on the whole armor of God, again, if you don't have your Bible, grab one and appear in front of you, have somebody pass one to you. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, page 1824 in the Pew Bible, page 1824. Now I can get to the message because this was just an introduction. I know some of you are panicking already. Now, verse 18, the NIV does not render it um, probably as, as, as literal as I would like, but so let me just give you a homespun translation. With all prayer and petition, and all at all times in the spirit, with this in mind, be alert. With all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Did you count how many alls? Good for you. My friend, the late John Stott, whom I've known since 1971, one of the great theologians of our times, he says, most Christians replace the word all with some. Are you with me? And he says, some, with some prayer, with some prayer, and some degree of perseverance, <laughs> and for some of God's people, they replaced all for some. Again, from Pilgrim's Progress, I want to read this passage. Now, I, this is old English, so persevere with me, please. It was when Christian perceived the mouth of hell, hard by the wayside in the valley of the shadow of death, and saw flame and smoke, and heard hideous voices, and he was forced to pull up his sword and betake himself to another weapon called all prayers. And so he cried in my hearing, O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. End of quote. Now, here the Apostle Paul is emphasizing what Jesus taught. This really was. He's amplifying what Jesus taught, namely the absolute necessity of being watchful in prayer all of the time. The frequency of all here is very important. It really is. Don't undermine it in your Bible. There are four times at least. Praying at all times with all persevering. That's very important. It's very important. The Word of God forever calls us to pray always. Always. That is not to undermine or take away from the time that you should spend daily in intimacy with God with the Lord. That's not, this is in addition to that. In variety of ways, the Bible tells us to pray, in, in, whether publicly or privately, or loud cries or soft whisper, uh, whether uh, uh, deliberately or spontaneously, uh, whether sitting or standing or kneeling or even lying down at home, at church, in the car, Jogging, exercising, wherever you are, wherever you may be, at work, on the road, with hands raised up or folded, with eyes open or closed, with heads bowed down or raised up, whatever and wherever you are, and in every situation and in every circumstances. Are you with me? Amen. You know, our Muslim friends pray five times a day. Because, of course, they're praying to a non-personal God. They don't really know God. They just go through this process, you know, five routine, five times a day. And they say if they miss one certain times of the day, if they miss one, there is a, 
a, a few minutes of grace or maybe an extra few minutes of grace. But then uh, if, if you miss even that time, the space, the, the extra time, then the prayer goes off, they say, <laughs> like a bad piece of fruit. It goes off. But beloved, we worship an omnipotent God, an omnipresent God, an omniscient God. He hears and answers prayers at all time and everywhere. Even in the Old Testament, they prayed three times in the morning, noon, and evening. But in the New Testament, we are encouraged all oh, dozens of times in the Scripture, I could have looked it up for you, to pray always, always. Why? What does it mean to pray all the time? It means, listen to me, are you hearing me say amen? amen. I want to make sure I haven't lost you. I may have lost some of you. Looking at you and saying, I can hear you breathing, but I'm not sure you're looking at me. Amen. What does it mean to pray? Always. It's being consciously, being continuously God conscious. Continuously God conscious. Whatever you see or hear or you experience becomes a subject of prayer. Are you with me? Yeah. I'll never forget many years ago, I took up uh, bike riding on the Silver Comet with two of my brothers um, in Christ, and, and, and we were riding one morning, one Saturday morning, and then there was an accident, and it was obviously bad enough that even the ambulance came on that narrow strip, and, and I said, let's stop, stop praying for the person who's injured. And one of my friends said, well, we don't know who they are. I said, that doesn't make any difference. <laughs> God brought us here at this time. So we can pray for that person. Praying always means to be deep in deep awareness of constantly surrendered to the Heavenly Father. When we hear of a need, immediately we stop and pray. Amen. When you experience a blessing, stop immediately and say, praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. When you wait until you go to a, a prayer time, when you see how some evil is being perpetrated. We cry out to God on the spot. Yes. When you run into some non-believing neighbor or friend or co-worker, you immediately pray for their salvation. Yes. Not loud. <laughs> we say, hey, Bill, Lord Jesus, save Bill. No. <laughs> you, pray, you pray in the, privately. My goodness, I've done that so many times. And then I pray for the opportunity that I might be able to witness to them. When you encounter a challenge, you immediately turn to God. Talk to God. Oh, beloved, listen. The ultimate purpose of our salvation is the glory of God. And that leads us to constant intimacy in His presence. Not just for the moment that we spend praying and reading the Scripture every day. I'm talking about moment by moment by moment. Amen. I'm sure some of you are probably asking, but what is this praying in the Spirit? What is this praying in the Spirit? Well, some of our Pentecostal and charismatic friends, not all of them, some, uh, they say, well, that means uh, you pray in tongues. Well, the text doesn't even go anywhere near that. It has nothing to do with that. So I'm not going to get into, into it. But praying in the Spirit means, listen to me, please. Praying in the Spirit, first of all, you're praying in Jesus' name. You, you, to pray in the Spirit means in your prayer is consistent with the Lord's, for His nature and with His will. Uh, to pray in the Spirit, that means you are in concert. You're in concert with the Holy Spirit. It means you have not grieved Him. Or if you have, you have prayed for repentance and ungrieved Him. Pray in the Spirit, meaning that you are not going to pray for something or about something that is outside of the Word of God or inconsistent with the Word of God or goes against the Word of God. Romans 8, 26 and 27 has been a huge comfort to me through the years. 
When I heard that expounded one year back in 1973, it's been absolutely huge comfort in my prayer life. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groaning too deep for words. I cannot tell you how many times I groaned in prayer. To pray in the Spirit is to be in harmony with the Holy Spirit. Let me repeat this. To pray in the Spirit, it means that you are in harmony with the Holy Spirit. That's why we are praying in subjection and in submission to the Holy Spirit. Not my whims, not what I think is right, not what I think is important, but what the Holy Spirit says is important. Oh, beloved, please listen to me. I'm going to be candid with you. I know that it kind of, it's oxymoron, as, as if it's, I'm, I'm going to be candid for the first time. Most Christians, most Christians never get serious about praying in the Spirit until a problem or a difficulty arises. Now, don't stop praying when difficulties are neither right. Don't stop that. Don't stop. That's not what I'm talking about. But prayer should be as regular as you are breathing. Yeah. Amen. You say, Michael, this is unrealistic. How, how can that be? Please try it. Yeah. Listen to me. If you see prayer as a continuous spiritual activity, then when the need arises, you're not going to stop and make a U-turn and stop praying. No, you're already in prayer. You're already into it. <laughs> just include whatever the challenge or whatever thing that just popped up, difficulty that popped up. And don't ever forget, please, please, please don't ever forget that the context of Paul asking us to pray in the Spirit is the spiritual warfare. Are you with me? It is in the context of being continuously alert, continuously ready for battle. You see, when you are praying in the Spirit all the time, you are in a state of watchfulness. You are in a state of alertness, of Satan's scheme all the time. You know the fascinating part about the next two verses in Ephesians 6? Fascinating to me anyway. <laughs> Paul, Paul doesn't pray for himself. He doesn't pray for himself. He asks them to pray for him. <laughs> Look at verses 19 and 20. Beloved, I'm absolutely convinced that the healthiest prayer life in a church, that's why if you missed the nine o'clock meeting with T.J. Diamond and small group, you know, call T.J., he'll assign you to a small group. <laughs> the healthiest prayer life is when we pray for one another. Amen. The most powerful prayer is when we are constantly praying for each other. Listen, I get more blessed when I pray for others than you can imagine. Prayer is not being self-absorbed. My needs, my wants, my agenda, and become so overly occupied with self. When Jesus said, seek First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that's in prayer. Since you're continuously praying, you're continuously seeking his kingdom and his righteousness. First, he said, watch out. All of your needs are going to be met. This will be added to you. 
as I pray for you and you pray for me, that is the highest form of praying in the Spirit. Verse 19, pray on my behalf that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. Don't miss this, please. I plead with you, don't miss this, don't miss this. He did not ask them to pray for his sore ankles because they have been in shackles and they're probably swollen and he was in pain. I promise you, I would have prayed for that. I ask you to pray for that. <laughs> that would be me. Hey, pray for my sore ankles. He didn't even pray, ask him to pray that he may be set free from the prison, from that miserable dungeon. I would have done that. Oh, my goodness. I would have made that my foremost in my mind. <laughs> but no, not the great apostle Paul. His priorities were far from self-occupation. His primary concern was the gospel proclamation. For his passion, his first passion, is for the lost people to be saved. His plea for prayer is that the kingdom of God would expand. Now, I'm going to tell you something, and I'm always very careful when I say, this is not in the Word of God, this is a personal opinion. When I tell you something that is my personal insight or my personal deduction, I'm going to tell you why, but it, doesn't mean, it means that you can take it or leave it, okay? <laughs> you can take it or leave it. It's just my personal deduction here. This petition, Paul is asking them to pray for him so that boldness, speak the truth, gospel, in my opinion, is because Paul was being tempted to be quiet about Jesus. Amen. He must have been tempted to remain silent about the message of salvation. He must have been tempted to just compromise a little bit in order to be set free. Again, I said, this is my personal opinion. I'm going to tell you why. I'll give you my reasons. Why would you ask people to pray for boldness if you're not tempted not to be bold? He's asking believers to intercede on his behalf so that he'll be faithful in his proclamation. To petition God to help him overcome that temptation that Satan is bringing his way. To plead with his brothers and sisters in Christ to pray for strength to overcome Satan's scheme to silence him or make him compromise. The fact that he was a prisoner, and I showed you one time a picture of that. I, I, I couldn't wait when I went to Rome. I want to see it. I want to see that place. It's a dungeon. It's a horrible place. The fact that he is in that miserable place, the fact that he's in chains, the fact that he's in solitary confinement, these were incidental as far as Paul was concerned. They were incidental. Listen to me. He would rather have them pray for spiritual victory, not even for his physical freedom. Hear me right. Hear me right. I'm going to say that with fear and trepidation, but it's the absolute truth. God cannot truly use a self-sufficient person. Oh, they may be big shots with tens of thousands of followers, and oh, they may have created a personality cult with millions of people just saying, quoting them all the time. That doesn't mean God is using them. 
I'm talking about saving of souls. God cannot use a self-sufficient person. Don't miss this. If the great apostle Paul recognizes the absolute necessity for God's people to intercede on his behalf. Who are we not to ask for prayer? Sometimes I get people who say, I hate to bother you. I know you're busy, but can you pray? I said, stop it. (laughs) It has nothing to do with that. Asking me to pray is a privilege. Why? Did Paul ask for prayer? Listen to me, beloved, and you know you see that every day in the news because he knew that Satan would go after spiritual leaders and pastors with vengeance as he's doing right now in order to discourage the sheep. Even in prison, he asked them to pray for the impact of the gospel. The impact of the gospel. But there's some irony here that I cannot conclude without drawing attention to it. It's a delicious irony. (laughs) I don't want you to miss this. I'm coming toward the end, so don't, don't let me lose you, okay? Paul saw himself as an accredited ambassador of Jesus to the courts of Rome. Paul was proud in good sense, good pride, to be an ambassador of Christ. But look at the anomaly here. It's an incredible anomaly. He is an ambassador in what? Chains. (laughs) Ambassador in chains. Normally people bow and scrape to an ambassador because they're representing their country, that country. Actually in Rome, Rome was at the height of its power at that time, okay? So during that height of its power in Rome, the dignitaries, the noblemen, the wealthy people, the elite of society, and the ambassadors from other provinces would wear heavy gold chains around their neck and on their wrists. Big gold chains. Especially in public occasions, public festivities, uh, national days, all the big celebrations. You see sometimes in the uh, crowning of a king or queen in England or them, just big occasions. They all put on they're as much of their gold chains around their necks and then their wrists as they can literally carry. What are they doing? What are they doing? They're showing off their power. They're showing off their wealth. They're showing off their status. Oh, but Paul knows that he is an ambassador of Christ crucified. He knows that he's a soldier in chains. And yet his biggest concern is the gospel. It's the gospel of Jesus. That's his biggest concern. I want to ask you this as I start, as I conclude here, but... I plead with you before God. I plead with every one of you here and those who are watching around the world. Don't, when I ask you a question, please do not fudge. Do, do, do not try to get out of it. You may not answer it in this moment, but you've got to answer it to yourself at some moment, at some time. And here's that question. What does your concern for the gospel What does your concern for the gospel fit in in your life's priority? Where does it fit in? Where does it fit in? Plead with you. Don't shrug it off. Don't rest until you answer it for yourself. Oh God, you're an amazing God.
I'm overwhelmed. Even more when I'm all alone with you of your long suffering and perseverance, your love and your patience. I'm so overwhelmed privately and publicly by your amazing patience of constantly warning us and constantly calling us and constantly pleading with us. Oh God, I pray, I cry to you. It would not be just a momentous or a moment conviction or even feeling bad. Don't allow that, please, Lord. But let this be a moment of transformation. Transformation in our prayer life. Transformation of our commitment to you, Lord Jesus, and your priority, not ours. For Jesus, we pray this in your name, knowing that you can do exceedingly abundantly above what we can think or imagine, for we pray that in your name. Amen. Amen.